are continuing in our revisit of the older sermon series, It's Not in the Bible, Letting Go of Commonly Held Statements. By confronting culture uncompromisingly, by confronting lies, we can uncover truth and cling to what the Lord says, knowing it truly comes from Him and therefore it is for us. In this series, we look at things the world teaches us and we compare it instead to what the Word of God teaches us. This morning, we're going to examine a statement with eternal consequence. Because the world believes so strongly that it is better to be served than to serve anyone else. Even if it's in the illusion of more with less, it has rallied under the phrase, it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. But to hear what the word of God says on this matter, turn with me to Psalm 84. At Psalm chapter 84. Beginning with verse 1, Psalm 84 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it to a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This psalm of the sons of Korah beautifully rejoices in getting to be in the presence of the Lord. During this trying time, when it is difficult to come into his house and gather in his name and worship him, we can better appreciate the words of the songs of Korah, longing to be in the presence of the Lord, to be in his courts. See, church is always meant to be a slice of home, a foretaste of eternity, of the perfect and ultimate experience of the presence of God. Surrounded by a cloud of witnesses in the glory of the Lord, when we may see him face to face. The simple pleasure of being there, whether crowned with many crowns that we lay at the feet of Jesus, or there just having escaped the flames, as 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, we're just happy to be there. And that joy, that gratitude, that appreciation of the invitation, we cannot lose it. We cannot lose sight of it, of Him, of how wonderful the Lord is. How wonderful the greatest person in all the world really is. It's all true. He really is that good. Better than we've ever heard or read. And how wonderful it is. That he should want us there with him. To be on his team. To be in his presence. To be in his courts. The greatest honor of our lives is giving to serve our Lord. It is not an odious task. It is not a teeth pulling, heel dragging venture to be called by the Lord God Almighty. And of all of his resources, all creation at his disposal, he wants you. Yes, you. Do something for him. Of all of everyone he can pick, God picks you. He asks you to serve, you to do. Little old you to represent the Most High God. So yeah, when you put it like that, sons of Korah, I would love to keep the door for the Lord. 
Because even a street sweeper in heaven is polishing gold. The world, however, has its priorities skewed. The world believes it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. They think they'd rather be a big fish in a small pond. You can go your own way, have it your own way world, would rather settle for less with the illusion of control than accept the greatness of God's gift at his service. And this is just an excuse to avoid organized religion, which is really just an excuse to avoid a personal, meaningful relationship with an all-powerful God that you must answer to. And we've all heard someone at a party muse that they're too much of a free thinker to go along, or I'm too intelligent for that. Or even worse, all the interesting people are going to be in hell. Hubris. Pride gets us into trouble more than anything else. Pride lies to us. It tricks us into thinking that standing tall in hell isn't still lower than kneeling in heaven. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven? Not at all. And the writer of that line, John Milton, didn't believe that at all. And neither did his characterization of Satan in his epic poem, Paradise Lost. See, in the context, Satan and his army of rebels handedly lost the war in heaven. And having the hubris to think that they can overthrow God, they are cast into hell, and then Satan merely tried to trick his own troops into thinking their damnation some kind of victory because he needed to delude them into still following him. Even before an angel of God explicitly repudiates this line of thinking, it is clear in the context of the poem that Satan knows he's beat. He just doesn't want anyone else to know it too. There is no glory in damnation. There is no victory in rebellion. There is no solace in hell. And no matter how heavy the burden of service is to the Lord, the serving is the victory, even through suffering. Dr. B.J. Miller once said, it is a great deal easier to do which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities of not doing. 1 Peter 5.10, Peter writes, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Roland Bingham, the founder of SIM Serving in Mission, wrote, It is the impassioned pleading of a quiet little Scottish lady that linked my life with the Sudan. In the quietness of her parlor, she told how God had called a daughter to China and her eldest boy, Walter Goins, to the Sudan. She spread out before me the vast extent of those thousands of miles and filled in the teeming masses of people. Ere I closed the interview, she had placed upon me the burden of the Sudan. A year and a half later, Bingham returned to Canada alone. Walter Goins and another missionary named Thomas Kent They lay buried in Nigeria's interior. I visited Mrs. Goins to take her the few personal belongings of her son. She met me with extended hand, and we stood there in silence. Then she said these words. Well, Mr. Bingham, I would rather have had Walter go out to the Sudan and die there all alone than have him home today, disobeying. There is great honor in pursuing God's glory by picking up your cross, denying yourself, following Christ, really following Christ. Service to God does not lessen you, it elevates us. Mark 10, verses 42 through 45, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life as a ransom for him. When we serve Jesus, he does not send you where he himself has not already gone. And he never sends you alone. The Holy Spirit not only encourages and equips and empowers you, he accompanies you every step of the way on every task. Service to God is not only good, it is how we most encounter Christ until we encounter him in eternity. Service to the Lord is holy and honorable, honoring both the one whom the service is for and, yes, the one doing the service. Why then, the scriptures say in Isaiah 65 too, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. The book of Judges is a walking study of the reign of man. We are bombarded with humanity's decisions and morality, told famously in Judges 21-25, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And interestingly, the lesser-known compliment that first book ends the book found in Judges 2, 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The song goes, everybody wants to rule the world. And we act like it. We always have a better opinion on how things should be. And whether this politician or that politician has it right, I am glad that God always has it right. I am very glad... I don't. I don't want to be in charge of the world because my judgment is imperfect and my vision is flawed. So why should I claim that power? Leave it to the one with perfect wisdom and perfect insight. Only by his perfect power can this crazy world be navigated to providence. After all, the world is safely hurtling around the sun at roughly 66 thousand miles per hour, and I know none of us are driving it. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. So perhaps the stars and the galaxies that we are not colliding into are providing testimony to the trustworthiness of God to have the whole world in His hands, and not ours. And in order to serve and to stop trying to reign we need to trust. 19th century Scottish minister Andrew Bonner wrote on the book of Leviticus saying, It is not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver that is to be the standard of obedience. Some indeed might reckon such minute and arbitrary rules as these as trifling, but the principle involved in obedience or disobedience was none other than the same principle which was tried in Eden at the foot of the forbidden tree. It really is this. Is the Lord to be obeyed in all things whatsoever? Is he a holy lawgiver? Are his creatures bound to give implicit assent to his will? Basically, is God worthy to be obeyed? If he is, then obey him. If he is not, then do not obey him. But don't quibble on this rule or that rule or our agreement with this principle or our disagreement with that principle. Either he is God or he isn't. And if he is God, if he is worthy to be praised, if he is righteous in all that he does, if he is wiser than anyone, if he is always right, if he is God, then obey him. Serve him. Trust him. Obedience is the fruit of trust. Obedience is the very expression of trust. If we only obey because we happen to agree, then we're wrong. We are doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. We must obey simply because he is God, and fundamentally, we finally recognize that we are not. Now, the devil hasn't learned that lesson. I mean, he tried to get Jesus to worship. 
Satan would rather play at being a false god with a false power and false authority than serve truth. He would rather live a lie than face truth. But believing a lie or wanting a lie has never made a single thing true. Only the truth is the truth is the truth. Lies are a prison of the mind and the heart, but the truth will set you free. The devil's in a prison of his own making because his rebellion is completely in vain. Anytime someone works against the will of God and tries to frustrate his inevitable plans, it is in vain. Now the book of Job reveals the next thing that we need to know about this equation. The great rebel Satan is subject to God. Yes, the greatest evil in the world, the most powerful force opposed to God. And when God says, come, he comes. And when God says, you can, you can. And when God says, you can't, you cannot. Job 1 verses 6 and 7 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And in the deliberation of the heart of Job's worship, it is abundantly clear in the text that Satan cannot do a thing to Job till he's got permission from God, and then only what he is allowed to do. It says in Job 1.12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, if Satan and his rebellion is still subject to the Lord, if the greatest, if we can call it that, if the greatest, the most deliberate, the most explicit, the most direct affront to God Almighty still results in the rebel restricted to the will of God, what folly is it to establish our own little kingdom outside of his kingdom? And have the audacity to say, I would rather rule this than serve you. When we neither rule nor stop being subject to his service. Psalm 2 verses 1 through 4 says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Rebelling against God can't be in vain. There is no gain. For the rebel can claim any crown he wants. God is still God, no matter what you call him. God is still king, whether you call him king or not. He is not subject to our whims or our opinions or our beliefs. God is God. And the rebel is just a fool. Poor, deluded fool. Because whatever we believe, we live in his world, by his rules. Rebellion is in vain. Foolish pride gets you nothing. Because whether you want to serve God or not, God's will is going to happen with or without our cooperation. Jonah, the rebellious prophet, he was given a word from God that he did not want to preach. He was called to call judgment on the wicked city of Nineveh and afraid that they would heed the word and repent and thereby be spared by the merciful God of heaven. Jonah ran in the opposite direction, heading to the end of the known world, and still he wound up exactly where God wanted him to be, delivering the message he wanted him to give, just delivered by the belly of a great fish because of Jonah's foolish rebellion. Balaam was the opposite side of the coin. He was a prophet that wanted to curse Israel for the gain of coin. But no matter how much he was paid, three times he tried to curse Israel. And three times blessings came out instead, bankrolled by their enemies, because only the word of God would leave his lips. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. 
suffered much for the sake of the kingdom of God. And at times, he didn't want to preach God's word on judgment on Jerusalem, not because he didn't want them to repent, but because they refused to, and they took it out on him. See, they didn't want to hear that God judged evil. And like the world today, they refused to believe that God would punish their evil, so they punished Jeremiah. And when the futility of it burdened him, when he physically felt that he couldn't do it anymore, he testifies honestly in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. The will of God will out. One way or another, the will of God is. And no man and no devil has the power to contain it, prevent it, or even just get in the way of it. Judas and Satan and the Pharisees and the Romans thought they were ending Jesus Christ's message with the cross. Their schemes to overthrow the gospel only set the conditions for Christ to fulfill the gospel. God's will be done. And you can be part of the solution or you can be part of the problem that God overcomes, but you cannot overcome God. God's will be done. Because God, you reign forever and ever. God, you reign. And as for the devil, he does not reign in heaven. The devil's not even in hell right now. In John 12, 31, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. And does so explicitly in the context of that prince falling under his judgment. And not later, but now. John 12, 31, Jesus says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. Cast out, but not yet in hell. Ephesians 2, 2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. And later on he says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The biblical imagery we are given is that Satan is not in hell, but in the lower heavens, the sky, going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it, from which he continues to vex mankind, tempt him, twist him, try to transform him into his own image instead of God's. The image not of the glory of God, made to serve him, made to be with him, made to be loved by him and reflect him in all that we say and do, but in Verse image of the devil, the deceiver and the deceived, a willful rebel with no regard for himself, let alone what's right. The devil would have you believe the lie that, that he is a martyr to be rallied upon. He may have lost, he may be losing, but at least he's doing it his way, and you can do it your own way too, if you do it his way and serve him. Follow the traitor's course is not a domain of your own, but to be subject to the grave and slave to sin. To be his. Oh, he'll let you think you're doing it on your own. That you're a unique rebel that conforms to no one as you follow the same broken path that leads all the way from God. Why would anyone look to the devil for He's a liar, and he's a loser. The prince of lies vanquished by the God of truth. See, even as the prince of the power of the air, he is nothing. All his power, his authority, his might, his strength, his will, his rule as the prince of the power of the air, and where does Christ return, beloved? From where does Christ return? In the glorious appearing our expectant hope, Jesus returns in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus Christ 
charging his return in power and power and glory to plunder the grave by piercing right through the stronghold of the devil. Luke 21, 26 and 27, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Christ goes right through the devil's territory unopposed. God's glorious revelation and it begins by showing how futile the reign of the devil always was. Ephesians 1. Verses 19 through 23 says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus reigns. The devil is ousted in the end. And his last vain attempt, his last spiteful act, will be to convince an army of humanity one more time that it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. He'll array an immense army as vast as the sands of the sea of people who do not want to serve in heaven, but follow Satan into battle against God. And as soon as they are assembled, as soon as they march upon the camp of Christ, they are immediately consumed by fire from heaven and cast into the fires of hell. Once the devil is cast into the pit and it is sealed, he's done. His story is over. There is nothing more to tell. The devil isn't going to be spending eternity reigning hell. He's trapped in it. And the great irony of the devil is that his Last rebellion, his last act is actually service to God, assembling all the rebels to fall under no banner at all, accomplishing nothing of value to him or any of them but to pave way to peace, paradise eternal. What good is your rebellion if you're still subservient? If you're still subject to the reign of the king, what would it profit you to cast aside the blessings of his favor if you are still subject to his judgment and power? James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons. Foolish enough to rebel. Wise enough to know God's power. So we can talk in the abstract and we can discuss theory, but the word of God gives testimony to our issue. Luke chapter 8, verses 27 through 33. That's Luke 8, 27 through 33 says, When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. This isn't the opinion of one. This isn't a small sample size. Legion isn't so much a name as it is a head count. The word legion in Hellenized Judah under Roman occupation meant a very specific thing. It unquestionably conjured in the mind the Roman army, a legion of which was 5,000 strong. And these unclean spirits 
Possessing this man possessed the strength, the power to snap chains and shackles. And immediately, seeing the Christ, they bowed down in his presence and begged him for mercy. They don't put up a fight. They don't even try to run. They beg. They grovel before God's son. And they gladly obey his command in escaping into a herd of swine that commits suicide by dashing themselves into the sea to drown rather than go into the abyss. Now ask yourself, with this evidence, with the testimony of a legion of demons that would rather die for Christ than go into the abyss, is it better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven? Do yourself a favor and ask yourself if hell shall be. Do not take hell lightly. We only consider hell a joke because that's the only way we'll consider it at all. It's the only way that we can comfortably handle it. Hell isn't comfortable. It's not slightly warm with rags and dirt. It is not prison. It is not second best. It is not where all the interesting people are. Hell is hell. Hell is literally the worst place because it lacks the grace and presence of God. Imagine your worst day, the worst place that you've been, the worst fear. But it never ends, and it never gets better. And it's far worse than whatever you're imagining. Hell is real. No matter how much you don't want it to be, no matter how angry you get with God for exercising his right and his duty to condemn and contain evil eternally in hell, hell is real. Mankind has tried to erase the existence of hell as a consequence in lukewarm modern theology and the fear of hell by simply making it a punishment. Now, I'm not going to go into all the illogical foolishness of universalism. I will cut to the quick and simply say that the vast majority of verses referencing hell are direct quotes of Jesus Christ. The majority of what we know about hell is written in red letters, and Jesus would know. Because he went there. When Jesus died on the cross, bearing all the sins in the world, he did not go to heaven. When he experienced the Father forsaking him for our sake, he made the only escape route out of the grave, the only get out of jail free card we're ever going to get, and the only one that we need. When we belittle the reality of hell, we undermine the value of what we are offered in Christ. We rob the gospel of the good news if we strip it of the context of our salvation. We weren't saved from poor middle management, and we weren't saved from bad days or merely human oppression. We were not saved from an allegory. Jesus Christ did not die in agony for a metaphor. He died to save you from weeping and gnashing teeth. He died to save you from outer darkness so Impressively absent joy, that not even the unquenchable fire produces light. He died to save you from torment day and night forever and ever without an end. He died to save you from a place where there is no hope. The Son of God did not waste his life on an inconvenient. take it lightly when we say that Jesus took our punishment. When we read the beauty of our gift in Isaiah 53, 5, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. When we say that Jesus took our place, this is what we mean. depths of hell serve to show us the greatness of God's love. Of a God that would do anything to keep us from a fate so heinous that he would take it himself. Take it away. As the old song says, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt As the good book tells us in Romans 6.23, for the wages of death, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's not just that our hell is taken away when we cling to Christ. Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that would be enough, more than enough, far more than I deserve. And yet my Christ is so good. So, so very good. And he gives us everything. Everything. Second Peter 1, 3, and 4, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Don't hear words. Don't hear just words. Hear truth. Hear reality. Stop hearing what you've heard a thousand times before. And think, feel, experience the truth of what has happened to you. Happened for you. Whether you have been a Christian all your life. Or you haven't accepted Jesus yet. Listen with your heart. To what it is. That he has done for you. Jesus paid it all. All of it. Every fear imaginable. Every pain. Every torment. And the weeping. He has taken it all for you. So that he could offer you a place. Where the weeping is. beauty of eternity revealed to us in Revelation 21 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the former things passed away. This is what it means. This is what salvation is. This is why we should rejoice that death and Hades itself will be thrown into the lake of fire, that all evil is sealed forevermore in the pit, that the pearly gates of heaven, all twelve of them, are wide open all day, every day, because there is no fear of anything coming in. That there is no night, only one eternal day, because we are basking forever in the light of Jesus Christ. Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27 continues saying, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is what it means to be free. Free from hell. Free from sin. Free from the past. Free. Because all that is wrong is sealed up where we need not go because Jesus has paid the price for you. The sweetness of salvation 
can only be embraced when we know what was taken away and what it was traded for. We are free. John 8.36 So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. We are free to serve in heaven. We get to serve in heaven. We get to be in the presence of Yahweh and we get to sing His praises. We get to be worthy of citizenship in His kingdom and we get to be obedient to the only one that is truly worthy of our obedience. And once we let hubris die and die to self, Christ is our gain and we discover, beloved, the great plan of God was not the mutually exclusive force decision that the world and the devil would have you believe. It is all a lie because the truth is the plan of God is that we serve in heaven and we get to reign in heaven. Kings of the new earth. And co-heirs with Christ Almighty. 1 Corinthians 6.3 Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Psalm 37.11 But the meek shall inherit the earth. 1 John 3.2 Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And Romans 8.17 And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is what it means to serve in heaven. This is what it means. So choose you now. What is better, to reign in hell or to reign in heaven? What is better? The pride of Satan or the humbleness of Christ that poured himself out to make you his co-heir and took away all that you deserve in order to give you all that he deserves. Hallelujah! Jesus reigns and by his reign we get to serve him and reign with him. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you that you sent us your Son, and with your Son, the promise of victory. With your Son, love and acceptance. With your Son, the King this world desperately needs. With all the failed leadership and the flawed ideas and the foolishness that reigns in this world. The prince of the power of the air vexing this world. We need the true king. And you gave him to us. And one day, one glorious day, the true king will return and reign and free us from foolishness. Free us from pride. Free us from vanity, vanity, all is vanity, so that we may understand truth, serve you with all of our hearts, and with freedom, be given the dominion that you planned for us in the garden. Be given the gift to partake of the vine and have all things that pertain to life and God. If we would only, Lord, humble ourselves and surrender to your plan for us, we can discover that it's far better than any plan that man or devil could ever come up for us. Thank you, God, that you reign, that you are right, that you are good, that you are God, that you are worthy to be praised. Thank you, God, for your reign. And thank you, God. Thank you, God. That despite my own foolishness, you would choose to ask me to serve you. I ask, Lord, that all the hearts would heed your call to serve you and discover truth, discover grace. 
Discover love. Discover your glory. In Jesus' name, humble us, Lord, to pray.